Well, you know what they say. Never let a good tragedy go to waste. To be honest, for the last couple years I've been thinking to myself, you know, I should pre-make a video about Lizzie, just in case. Two things always stopped me. First, I thought for sure she'd be writing a letter to herself in 2026 in congratulations of her 100th birthday. And second, it's really difficult to talk about Queen Elizabeth II as a person, and that's by design. This woman spent a lifetime perfecting the art of living in the press, being as likable as possible, while saying virtually nothing. So why make this video? I mean, other than a belated attempt at getting views, of course. Well, I'm not here to indulge in every tabloid headline of the last 96 years. That might be interesting, but I want to know, what was it like to live as the most prominent of the royals? What exactly did she do? And most of all, what changed in both the role of the British monarchy and Britain itself in the seven decades since she took the throne? So strap in, let's do some history. Today's video was brought to you by Masterworks. More about them when you least expect it. Our dear Queen Elizabeth was born in 1926 to about the usual amount of fanfare for a royal baby, which is to say she appeared on the cover of Time magazine by the time she was three. But you know, I was Time's 2006 person of the year, so rack'em one, queen zero. She wasn't even supposed to be queen, really. The king at the time, known to Elizabeth as Grandpa England, died in 1936 and left the kingdom to Elizabeth's uncle, Edward VIII, but that turned out to be a problem. Now, the British monarchy has been impotent for longer than you might realize. America likes to make a fuss about how the Founding Fathers rejected the tyranny of King George III, but the last monarch to say no to literally anything passed by Parliament was Queen Anne in 1708. However, as King of the United Kingdom, you still have three basic jobs, and one of these did not fly for King Edward. Number one, say yes to whatever Parliament does. Open their sessions, approve all their laws, appoint whoever they tell you to be Prime Minister. Number two, socialize with world leaders. Don't actually do any serious business with them, that's what ambassadors are for. Just be kind of a cultural ambassador. Show them around Buckingham Palace and tell them about what a swell place Britain is. Number three, lead the Church of England. That may sound like a lot of responsibility, but in reality, it's a lot like job number one. There's a couple of guys in the House of Lords who'll tell you who you're supposed to appoint to different jobs. The only difference is that you've got to be Anglican Christian, go to church every now and then, and don't do any of the big religious no-nos. Well, in 1936, one of the big no-nos was divorce. The Church of England, which was specifically created so that one guy could get out of his marriage, was not big on the idea of second marriages in 1936. So when the king wanted to marry an American commoner on her third marriage, he was deemed not kingly material and pressured to abdicate. That's how Elizabeth's dad gets to be king. So we're going through the middle of the Great Depression, fascism starts to catch on in Europe, then Charlie Chaplin and Cursed Mario take over Poland, and we've got World War II. This is around the time Elizabeth starts addressing the public, went on her first radio broadcast in 1940 to lift the nation's spirits. We are trying to do all we can to help our gallant sailors, soldiers, and airmen. And we are trying to to bear our own share of the danger and sadness of war. Chin up, keep calm, carry on, God's on our side, and other generic well wishes, you know the sort. Weirdly, it's probably her time as a princess that we've got the most personal insight on, since her former nanny wrote a book about working with the royal family in 1950, but even then, it's probably nothing you haven't heard already. Not too shocking to imagine that Elizabeth II was an upstanding young girl who struggled with having her life publicly scrutinized. As a matter of fact, so not a fan of having her life publicly scrutinized was the Queen that when the book came out, the royal family ostracized the author for the rest of her life. The woman actually bought a house right outside Balmoral Castle so that the royal family would have to drive right past her front door. They didn't call. They didn't call when her husband died, or when she tried to kill herself. She half-raised two girls and they didn't even send a wreath to her funeral. But on the bright side, that's how we got all the hot goss about Elizabeth's husband. I realize it's difficult to picture a fairy tale romance looking at this, but it's actually kind of a sweet story. They liked each other for a really long time, but you know, in typical almost Disney-esque fashion, you mustn't so much as hint as a royal teenager that you might be 
flirting with someone. So they had a song that was special to them that they'd request at every party they both attended and sort of give each other a knowing look at the ball while dancing with somebody else. Eventually, the proper arrangements were made, and they were married in an exquisite wedding ceremony in 1947. Then, in 1953, after inheriting the throne and becoming Time's Person of the Year, Elizabeth was crowned in a magnificent coronation ceremony that cost roughly 50 million dollars in today's money. But as luck would have it, she received a rather generous windfall after the death of her father. At the time of her death, Elizabeth was worth something like 500 million dollars, which is nothing to sneeze at, but does put a few hundred of her subjects ahead of her in terms of wealth, until you realize that's just her personal portfolio. The Crown Estate, which she didn't own directly and could never sell, but still very much used and benefited from, is, according to CBS News, worth over 34 billion. And, uh, that number's only getting bigger. They've got their portfolios and real estate and what have you, and then you've also got the Royal Collection, which is something like 7,000 paintings, 30,000 watercolors and sketches, 500,000 prints. Now those aren't just keepsakes, they're working to keep the crown's money safe. 13 trillion's been wiped from the stock market this year, and inflation's sitting around 10% in the UK, but how much do you think this Warhol is worth compared to when they bought it in 2012? The art market be crazy. Contemporary art has outpaced even the S&P 500 by more than double for the last 26 years, and the last time inflation was this high, it performed even better. You see where I'm going with this, right? If you're not the Queen of England, how do you help build and preserve your wealth with multi-million dollar art, you go to Masterworks. Masterworks buys high-end contemporary art and breaks it into shares. This means you can see the incredible potential results of investing in this high-end contemporary art at a price that works for you. They've sold six paintings so far with an average net return of 29% to their investors, so you can see why there's a wait list as traditional investments continue to suffer. But you, dear viewer, can skip the wait joining their over 500,000 members simply by going to masterworks.art. Jack Rackham. There's a quote by Frederick the Great of Prussia that I think describes what makes Elizabeth stand out in my mind, and that's the idea that the king, or in this case queen, is the first servant of the state. Now, Frederick personally led a tiny kingdom through the bloodiest war of a century, and Elizabeth is best known for coddling 15 generations of corgis, but even before taking the throne, the way she talked about herself, or I suppose the way she and her speechwriters came up with to talk about herself, was with an emphasis on service. And on her Platinum Jubilee this very year, it was the same attitude. The opportunities to serve your people as a ceremonial head of state are an awful lot smaller than as the head of government, but it seems like Lizzie was always on the lookout. Even as a teenager, she was putting on events to raise money for new military uniforms during the war, and then as queen, she found a way to play her small part in international relations, visiting all kinds of places no British monarch had ever gone before. Australia, New Zealand, China, Yugoslavia. The Canadian Prime Minister even credited her with having a behind-the-scenes role in the ending of apartheid? And who can forget her all-important role in hosting people from around the world at her home? Like that time she hid in a bush to avoid the dictator of Romania. Or the time some random dude showed up in her bedroom one morning. Nowadays, her whole family seems to have have one philanthropic pet project or another. Of course, there is that one grandson. We'll get to him. The end result is that Elizabeth was stupidly popular, definitely more popular than the monarchy itself. When Rhodesia declared independence in 1965, they refused to be part of the Commonwealth, but made their own monarchy just so that Elizabeth could still be their queen. Of course, she wasn't completely without controversy. For one thing, she came to the throne with a lot of colonies. There is a chunk of people out there today who are decidedly not grieving. I personally struggle to feel too embittered towards a figurehead, as opposed to someone who affected real policy, but it's a bit generous to say, please direct only your pride and well wishes for Britain to the monarchy, and reserve any and all sour feelings for the politicians. If you're the face of the British Empire in 1952, you also get some of the baggage that comes with that. But speaking of decolonization and the Commonwealth, did you know that in 1956, as the British Empire was breaking apart and this weird nebulous thing we call the Commonwealth was taking shape, there were talks about having France joining the Commonwealth. That didn't go anywhere, but holy crap, imagine France having a British head of state. So anyway, all that traveling the world and 
and rubbing elbows pretty much accounts for Elizabeth's life in the 50s, and the 60s, and then the 70s, and also the 80s. By the time the 80s came around, there was already this sort of frenzied interest in the royal family that effectively turned their lives into an international soap opera. Every piece of news about them was so secretive and based in rumor anyway that it became very easy and very profitable to just make stuff up. And then in the 90s, some bad stuff actually did start happening and the world was ready to eat it up. A lot of it was just bad timing. In 92 alone, her daughter got a divorce, part of Windsor Castle caught on fire, Prince Charles and Diana got divorced. But the 90s also had the larger issue, for the Queen anyway, that the British public in larger numbers were starting to ask questions about the monarchy. Questions like, does the work that she does justify her insane levels of wealth? Even if it does, does the job have to be hereditary? I mean, the Carnegies and the Rockefellers rubbed elbows and got into philanthropy, but the US didn't enshrine them in the Constitution for it. The result that decade came to be that their funding was reduced and Elizabeth for the first time would have to pay an income tax. Guess it's true what they say about death and taxes. Then of course there was Diana's death, which spawned a whole set of conspiracy theories. Other than that though, same old, same old. More corgis, so many corgis, pretended to jump out of a helicopter in 2012, met Paddington Bear. Things for the monarchy were back on track for a while. Support seems to have peaked around 2011 and been dropping recently, even before her untimely end. Maybe that has something to do with Harry and Meghan disowning themselves to live in California, or with the victim of sex trafficking who accused Jeffrey Epstein's good friend Prince Andrew of sexually assaulting her. Could be. It's still about two-thirds of the British who'd rather keep the monarchy, and I mean, at this point, the royal family are basically state-sponsored Kardashians. So if they bring in more money to the UK than it costs to keep them around, I say why not? But right now, support among young people is at just about an all-time low, only 33% in ages 18 to 24. Now maybe King Charles is really gonna put on the charm and knock their socks off, but I don't know. Call me rash, but I wouldn't be too surprised if after a thousand years we were watching the monarchy's final decades. Elizabeth felt like the world's grandma. I'm not so sure about the rest of them. Or they could just pick a new family by lottery every time the monarch dies. That would be way more fun.